made a decision to come out here this morning. I'm thrilled that you're here, and I hope this message is uplifting for you and edifying. That's something I pray before each lesson, before I look at each lesson, is that um, God's will be done, and that the words that I speak is His words, and not just what I would have spoken. So if you want to turn with me and look, it's in 1 Timothy chapter 6. I want to look at being this topic about contentment. And I thought this chapter lays it out very, very well. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning at verse 6, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. So everything we have in this world is meant to be used right now. It's meant to be used, it's going to be used up, and no matter what we try to put up, generations from us now and the future, when they have hold of those things, they may keep them, they may not, but it's not meant for us to have our mind totally focused on those things. It's meant for, we are meant to look beyond this life because where we find contentment is where our heart will follow, where our mind will go, and where our feet will lead. So if I'm not content with the things of God, now I'm looking for contentment in the things of the world. So godliness with contentment is great gain. Those two things coupled together is great gain. Just as it says here, godliness with contentment. See, if I am content with the things of this world, I may be happy. Oh, I may be happy beyond measure. There's people in this world, they are happy, they are so happy, but it's not because they have godliness in their life. It's because they're content with the things in their life that they desire and that they wanted. For instance, if I were in this world, if I were a rich, rich Man, if I was as rich as Bill Gates, or if I was as rich as Jeff Bezos, or if I was as rich as you plug in the name, or a kingdom of whatever, and I'm extremely happy with myself, I have all these riches, and then I die, did it matter that I was happy and content? Not in the least. And we can see multitudes of examples, even carnal examples, even looking at the Scriptures, of people that are rich that commit suicide. There's people that go out in this world and they say, I am so happy with these things, but then you outwardly, but inwardly, you look at them and they're, they're always searching for more. They're always looking for more. Why? Because the things in this world perish with using, and they're always wanting more because ultimately we were designed and we were supposed to be in the garden we're supposed to be in the garden. Ultimately, we fell from that. We're supposed to be there. and We're supposed to be walking with God. And until we get back to that point, we're not going to be happy because we were designed that way. We were designed that way. We were intended from the beginning to be that way, to walk with the Lord. We were intended to be that way. And we will never truly be happy We'll find temporary pleasures, as the Scripture says. talks about how that sin is pleasurable for a season. We'll find pleasure in those things for a little while, but they will fade away and we'll look for something else. What does it say in verse 8 in the same chapter? And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. We all have that. Every one of us has that. Evident in the fact that we're dressed, we have raiment. Evident in the fact that we're not starving, we have food. We should be content. We should be content with those things. A lot of times men aren't content with those things. A lot of times men aren't and they will go out searching for other things, other ish, other pleasures because they're not content with those things. Why? Because when they see those things, although they have them, they want more or something else because they desire something other than what God says. That's ultimately what happened. You know, that's what happened with Adam and Eve. Think about it. Think about Eve. Eve's in the garden. She has everything she needs. Adam has everything he needs. He has Eve. It's not good for man to be alone. God made him a helpmeet. He had everything he needed. But Eve being tempted by Satan and Adam going after what Eve put in front of him, they weren't happy and content with just striving with what God says. And they went after something else and they fell. And that's exactly what happens with us in this day and time. That if we're not happy with what God provides and we go after something else, we'll get the, the literally the proverbial stool knocked out from underneath our feet and we'll fall. 
because we're not happy with just what God says. He provides what we need, yet are we happy with it? I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 6. Verse 9, beginning. After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. From thine is the kingdom, for thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That prayer. Give us... This day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We could follow that. We could follow that. And a lot of times men are not happy to follow that. They don't want to forgive other people. They don't want to forgive other people the things they've done. They're not happy with that. They're not happy just to follow what the Scriptures say. I'm going to go over and read in verse 19 as well. Verse 19, the same chapter. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Wherever you're looking for enjoyment, wherever you're looking for those things which bring you joy, that's where your heart's going to be. That's always where you're going to look toward. That's what you're going to go after. You can't avoid it because that's where you get your joy from. Nobody that's in their right mind is looking for something to bring them despair and heartache and problems and trouble. They Always, people always say, I want to be happy. I want to look for joy. I want something that brings me pleasure. Well, if my pleasure comes from worldly things, then I'm going to be happy in that thing and not content in what God gives me. So I have to watch. We have to be careful. We have to watch those things. I'm back in 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm going to continue to reference that for a moment. But in chapter and verse 9, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And that's important what it says there. For the love of money is the root of all evil. That's where your heart, it's not that I have these things, it's evil that I have those things, but that I love those things, therefore my heart is going after those evil things and the love of money. Therefore, I'm not content with God and I'm not giving thanks to God for the things that I have. If I have the love of money in my heart, it's the root of all evil, so that I would go after all things to get money. I would do anything, if I love that, I would do anything to get that money. We see it in today's society, just as they've seen it then, just as we can go back throughout history and see it in other places as well. For the love of money is the root of all evil. People will murder for money. You hear about it now. Somebody will hire a hitman, and they'll go out, and they will, the term we use, a hitman, it's a manslayer, but they'll hire someone, and they'll go out and kill someone. Why? Because of money. Love of money. They love those things. They're not in any way looking for godliness. No matter what they say, their actions say otherwise. In verse 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Flee those things. Run away from them. If my temptation is one of those things, and everyone's temptation is something in the world, that's where temptation is and lies. But if that temptation is so great in my life and if I see those things I would go after, it would be better if I were to run totally away from it than to stay around and let someone tempt me with that or to see that or to go after it or let it ponder in my mind that I would fall because I would go after that because I love the things of this world. No, I need to run away from it. As it says here, O oh, man of God, flee these things. That's in several contexts. To stay away from or literally, if you need to, run away. Flee from it. Stay away from it. It is better. It is better for the people that you're with, your friends, your colleagues, society, to say, Oh, look at that guy. He's run away from whatever it is. Then for God to look down and say, That's terrible what he's doing. It is better for God to say, 
that's a good and faithful servant. He didn't want to have anything to do with that evilness and for man to make fun of you. Far better. Far better. And when I say this, I want to mention this too. I'm not saying that we shouldn't take care of our families as best that we know how. I'm not saying that at all. To the contrary, what I'm saying is that we should be thankful for the things that we have and our mind should not be consumed with the things of this world and only go after the things of this world and that's our desire. We should be very thankful. When we are thankful, when God blesses us with opportunity to serve Him, provide for our families, to do things for others, we should be very thankful and know that it comes from Him. Very thankful for that. Very thankful for those opportunities. Now I'm going to go over and look at a man that was wealthy. It's in Job. It's chapter 1. This man was upright before God, but he was wealthy. He had all kinds of things. In Job chapter 1. As a matter of fact, Job was doing things so right, he was doing things so much, that Satan took notice of him. In Job chapter 1, verse 1 beginning, There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and shewed evil. And there were and there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance was also with seven thousand sheep and three thousand camels and five thousand and five hundred rather yoke of oxen and five hundred she asses and a very great household. So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. We could read that one verse when we look at many more that shows us here this man. Well, you see, this man had a great abundance of things, but he wasn't evil. Job's love wasn't of money. Job's love wasn't in the worldly things. Job's love was of God and serving Him, whether he had a multitude of things or a few things. That's the importance here. That's why it's so vital. And I want to look at something else here about Job too. And his sons went and feasted in their houses everyone this, everyone his day and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, I may, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. See, that's one of the dividing factors about Job. And I haven't always noticed that about Job. I know that Job was upright before God. Job was wealthy. He had a lot of substance. He had a large family. Especially by today's standards, that's a very large family. And, but Job was consistent. Job was not a fly-by-the-night servant to God. No. No, Job was... Thus did Job continually... Job, when he set his mind to something, he continued therein. And when I said that he was doing stuff so right that Satan took notice, we know that what it says here, and say, I'm going to go over and read a verse 7 here, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence thou comest? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Job knew, the Satan knew all about Job. He knew that he was upright before the Lord. But what he's doing is trying to say that, well, Job is only doing this, he's only being upright before you because he's getting all these things. And, of course, we know as we read through the Scriptures, that wasn't true. Not in any case. Job was serving God because he loved God. He was content to serve God. Again, whether he had a few things or he had a lot of things, he would serve God faithfully, no matter what. He was content in what God gave him. He was very content. And it's so important to be content in serving God. And also to not be double-minded. That's why I brought that out, because Job was not double-minded. Job continually served God no matter what was going on. He always had that in his mind. You read through Job and you see that. You see a man that at his lowest estate, he wanted to serve God and be faithful to God. In his highest estate, when God lifts him up and gives him all these things, before tribulation and afterwards, he wants to serve God faithfully no matter what is going on. I'm going to go over to Genesis chapter 39. I'm 
and we'll read verse 1. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was, pros he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Think about what they just what was just said here. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. Joseph is a slave, but he's a prosperous man. Why? Because the Lord was with him. It doesn't matter where you are if you're serving God. It matters that he's with you. He's still prosperous. This man was sold into bondage, but still wanted to serve God faithfully. This man had brethren that couldn't stand him and were so jealous of him, they would sell him into slavery. This man was taken from his land, the, his dad who he loved, his family, taken over here to Egypt in a place where he is not familiar with the king there. He's not familiar with Potiphar. He's not from that household, and he sold as a slave. Could you imagine that? Yet... He was one to serve God faithfully. Because God was with him, he was prosperous. It's proof positive that it doesn't matter where you're at. You can be in the worst circumstances in this world and taken to foreign lands, but serve God faithfully and still prosper and still be blessed from God because you're purposefully purpose in serving God. You purpose that, not haphazardly but purpose in that. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. The things that we think are impossible in this life are possible with God. And the things, if I were to think about someone that was sold into slavery, and you know that still happens today. It's not something that doesn't happen today, especially when you look over in places in the Middle East or some places in Africa where you'll see people that are sold into slavery. A lot of times we hear about news, young girls are sold in, as slaves. And that still happens today. And we think about how a despairing situation that would be if you were to be uprooted from your house and your home and your country and your family and your friends and taken over here and you're sold into slavery and how detrimental that would be. Yet if you were, and I hope it never happens to anybody here, anybody understand my voice that may watch this later either, and I hope it doesn't happen to anyone. I know that it does at times with people. But nonetheless, no matter the situation, if you're serving God faithfully, you can still be prosperous. The situation of which you find yourself in can be totally different than how you see it if you're serving God faithfully. There's men in this world right now that are serving prison sentences. And they're in prison, and we think about prison as it is a despairing place. It's not some place I would want to be. It's not some place I'd want you to be. But nonetheless, those men are in prison, and they come to the realization in their mind that they need God in their life. They repent and they're baptized for the remission of sins. And while they're in there in a place that you would say, think is so despairing, they lead other people to Christ. Why? Because they purpose in their mind they're going to serve God no matter where they're at, no matter what's going on, no matter what is happening in their life. Because ultimately, we all leave this life and ultimately, we all have to give an account of the things we do in this life regardless of where I'm at. Regardless of the circumstances of what happens to me, I have to give an account of, did I serve God faithfully? Because we're not promised. We're not promised in the Scriptures that I won't be in an un, in, uncomfortable location. That I won't be in an uncomfortable place. That I won't be somewhere that I'd rather not be right now. We're not promised that. To the contrary, we see in the Scriptures and many times the apostles and disciples following after God, following after what Christ said, they were in uncomfortable situations, but yet they were serving God faithfully. They are content to serve God regardless of the circumstances, regardless of where they find themselves. I'm going to go over to Romans chapter 8. I'm going to read verse 31. 
what shall what shall we then say to the these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Oh, it may not be what I like. It may not be where I like. It may not even be the kind of food I like. Where I'm at and what I need to eat and where I'm, what I'm doing. I might not like that in the carnal sense of the things that I would prefer and where I would prefer to be at. But if I'm serving God faithfully, if I'm serving Him faithfully, regardless of those circumstances, I'm doing exactly what I need to do. I'm exactly where I need to be. I'm saying those things around people. You may be in a situation where you find yourself where everybody around about you is lost. Now it's easy, it's very easy, to be in amongst believers and say, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I'm going to serve God faithfully. It's another thing, if I find myself in a place where everybody around about me is not Christians, maybe they have no respect of God, maybe those people around about me doesn't even like me talking about the Bible, but those are the ones that need to hear it the most. And you may be in that situation where you're at, but you are there in a capacity with the truth of the gospel, with the knowledge of God, to lead those in darkness to light and find contentment in that. Could you imagine? Could you imagine someone that you see out there that is murdering Christians? They're murdering Christians. They're dragging them out of their homes. And they hear exactly what they need to hear and they turn from that. And you know the story of that. You know who I'm talking about. That was Saul. Our brother Paul, who we can't gain the name Paul, because he turned from those things and served God faithfully. There's people in this world, they're in the same boat right now, that are slaying Christians, despising Christians, serving evilness, and they need to hear the gospel. And I don't know what situations you may find yourself in, but I know, as I've said this before, I know each and every one of you are born in this time right now because you're supposed to be here right now. So the things around about us that need to be changed, the people around about us that need to hear the gospel, they need to hear it from us too. They need to hear that from us. It is our responsibility. It is our responsibility. Are we content in that? Are we content in serving God faithfully? It is necessary. I hope we always are. I hope we're always... Faithful in that. I want to go over and look in just a few verses more with you in Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to read verse 45. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. You know, I may not understand everything that's going on around about me. I may not understand why certain things happen. But I know God is in control. He makes the sun rise. He makes the sun fall. He makes the rain descend. He stops the rain. It's all in His hand and His control. And that's where I lean on Him. I don't understand all the times why people around about me in times and places I go, why they say some of the things they say. I don't understand why sometimes. I know that they're going after evil, but I don't always understand why things play out the way they do. I know God is in control, and what I do is serve God, serve God faithfully, spread His Word, and know that He's there with me, helping me. And He's there with you too. He's there with you too. It's not exclusive to one individual. Everyone that's a Christian, if you're serving God faithfully and you're going out working for Him, He is there with you. He is there with you, helping you. You turn to Him, He helps you. You need contentment, you turn to Him and pray to Him for contentment and peace. And He gives you peace beyond anything a man could do. We look, we look in all places in this world for contentment. The kind of contentment that God gives you, it's lasting. It can be something that comes over you and you don't understand the situation you're in. You don't understand how that the things going on around about you are happening, but you're content in serving God and you have that peace, that peace in your life in serving God faithfully. I'm going to go over to Psalms chapter 73. I'm 
and read verse 26. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and poor, and my portion forever. You know, there's things going to fail me. There's things I'm going to have trouble with, but God is my strength. He's my portion. He's who I lean on for strength in times of despair, in times of happiness. He's who I lean on. He's who I look to in all those things. I'm going to go over Daniel chapter 5. Do you know how important it is for kids to know this? You know, as Christians, we understand how that we need to turn to God in all things. You know how important it is for kids to know that? Think about what happens if a child doesn't know to turn to God. They'll turn to everything else. They'll turn to everything else they can turn to. They'll turn to any kind of drug. They'll turn to any kind of entertainment. They'll turn to anything their flesh gives them pleasure in because they don't understand how important it is to turn to God. They need that example and to hear that from us. But in Daniel chapter 5, verse 23, But hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and of gold and of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God of whose hand thy breath is, and whose are thy all are all thy ways, has thou not glorified. My breath and yours, and everybody in this world's breath, is in the Lord's hand. Could be taken away in a second, could be extended, could be steadfastly as you as an individual be helped in those times of need. But that breath that He gives us is in His hand. All that I have is in His hand. All that I've been blessed with is because He's blessed me. All that each and every every good gift, as the Scripture says, every good gift that you receive comes from God. It's His good pleasure that He blesses you with those things. So we should never be pridefully lifted up or looking for the pleasures of this world. We should be thanking Him and looking to Him. I'm going to go to read these last ver- last two sets of verses with you. It's in Fli- Philippians, it's chapter 4. And it's verses, beginning verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If we are content in God, if we're content with Him, godliness with contentment is great gain, then we'll have that peace because we will turn to Him for that peace. Now, if we're out in the world, we won't. We won't have that peace. Again, it's a temporary thing that we go after pleasures of this life, but they'll end. So my hope is that everyone will always have, everyone will always look to God for that peace. But if there's anyone that's not a Christian, I want to read these verses. They may hear this no matter when they may watch this, and that they may obey what the gospel says. But in Romans 10, 17, So the faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Hebrews 11, 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Luke 13, 3, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. In Romans 10, 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. That's the final result. So we have to make sure that we are right before God before we leave this life. Thank you for your time as we come together and sing the selected song.